This is Becoming Her, a podcast for survivors of abuse or assault to share their stories. I'm your host, Emily Kemp, and I'll be having a conversation with a different survivor each week. I want to be sure to include a strong trigger warning with this podcast. The content we discuss includes topics related to violence. Listener discretion is advised. So hi. Hi. Welcome to Becoming Her, the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm really, really excited to have you. Um, And so for all of our listeners who don't know who you are, why don't you start by just introducing yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Kristen Glasheen from Bozeman, Montana. Awesome. And what do you do here in town? Well, currently I am a student and employed by Bozeman Deaconess Health. I am a rad tech. I take x-rays. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, do you get to like see scary bones popping out of skin? I get to see some cool some things. Stuff. Yeah, I right. got a pretty cool job that I've worked really hard for, so I've Yay. been digging it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, now that that's kind of out of the way, introductions are out of the way. Um, I usually start by just kind of asking, you know, um, whoever's on the show to talk about their experience. Why you're here? Why are you on the podcast? Why am I here and on the podcast? Well, one is that I am a huge We Are Her fan and have been following We Are Her for quite some time. I was really lucky to be a part. Well, I'm really lucky to be a part of a group called End the Silence, where I met you (laughs) and Stevie and uh, just through forming those relationships and sharing stories we kind of have fast forwarded to being here and i'm excited to be a part of this movement which is so much bigger than this room and our town i feel like we are so lucky to be a part of the world movement of talking about unhealthy relationships domestic violence and making it something that's not so taboo i feel like had this been something that was out. I think we were talking today, texting a little bit about what we were going to talk about today. And I was just like, God, like if this had been a part of my life mm. 20 years ago, mm-hmm. what would have been different for me? Um, and definitely grateful for the experiences that I've had to put me in this chair to be someone who can help continue the movement. I by no means feel like we've sparked it, but I think... Through and the silence oh, and yeah. the things we've done, we've really been a huge part of it. Right. And I like the word movement as well because it like speaks to like a forward motion and energy and we're kind of riding the momentum of a whole culmination of a bunch of different movements coming together, like the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement. And, you know, we're finally in a political climate where people are actually willing to talk about these really uncomfortable issues. Um, and I feel very similarly to you about, man, I wish someone had talked to me about this stuff you know, when I was in high school and even earlier. Um, It's important information. Um, And so with that, I guess, is there anything about your story in particular that you wanted to share? Wow, yeah, I feel like to talk about my story, I I have to like start from the beginning. Sure. And domestic violence has been a part of my life since I was born. Mm. I know that... My parents struggled with an unhealthy relationship, and that led to them getting divorced when I was two. I was the youngest of four, and my mother, unfortunately, through her addictions and her own struggles in life, ended up in an incredibly abusive relationship. And so my very first memory is of my mom being beaten, and from there, it it escalated to being the biggest part of my childhood Mm. and unfortunately like we know from statistics if you grew up in a house full of violence you are most likely going to either become a victim or the perpetrator and I fell on the victim side of things quickly in life and landed myself in a really terrible relationship and it was my first love and because nobody had the conversations with me mm. that told me what I had seen with my mom was wrong and 
didn't talk to me about healthy relationships mm-hmm. and healthy boundaries and communication. It was somewhat comforting and normal right. to end up there. And I think a lot of people hear those words like, like it feels normal, and they think that's a conscious decision, but the brain doesn't work like that. When you're a child and your brain is developing, it will literally hardwire itself around whatever stimuli is coming in. And so because you were so young when that trauma was happening in your home, your brain literally hardwired it around that trauma. And so then when you're finding yourself older and entering into your own relationships, the brain will gravitate towards what feels familiar to it. So it's not like you wake up and are like, ah, my mom was in an abusive relationship and now I will be in, abusive rela- in an abusive relationship. It's, it's much, much, much more subtle than that and under the surface than that. Absolutely. Um, and I know a lot of survivors who are like, how did I end up in this situation? I told myself I would never be in this because I saw, you know, my parent go through it. And, um, and that's just the brain wants what the brain wants. Yeah, and it it gets it. Mm -hmm. And then you stay there out of comfort and fear, which, you know, even now, like saying those two words together, you know, Mm -hmm. like the comfort and the fear, you become comfortable in the fear of so many things. And for me, it became the fear of being alone. And I didn't even know that at the time. Like your level of awareness wasn't there. Yeah. To understand that, you know. And for me, that stemmed from, you know, so my mom, drug problem, domestic violence. I lived with my mom until I was nine with my two older sisters who were 10 and 12. And we moved in with my dad when I was nine years old and my mom disappeared out of my life for a period Mm -hmm. of time due to those two things. Right. The violence the drugs, the alcohol. Um, She spent some time in jail. You know, we didn't really know where she was for a period of time. And so there's the abandonment Mm -hmm. part for me right there. And when I went to go live with my dad and my stepmom and my other siblings, so my two sisters I'd been living with, the three of us moved in with my blood brother. Because remember I said there was four of us that my dad... And my mom had and my stepmom's two kids. So then we went from being three to six kids. And we lived like upper middle class. But like my parents worked all the time in order to sustain. I mean, can you imagine six kids? Right. It's very expensive. Like one kid is expensive, you know. So they were gone all the time. And I was pretty much left to care for myself. Mm. And so at a very young age, I sought out the attention of men. I was promiscuous and landed in my relationship with Eric. Mm. And it lasted for three and a half, four years. Wow. It escalated slowly. And by the time it was full-blown volatile. I was incredibly attached to the idea of believing that no one would love me Mm. for so many reasons. Right. And there's like the fear piece, you know? And so I stayed out of fear, out of comfort. And yeah, it it's crazy. Like I feel like even still today you know, so many years ago, um, it just always have a lasting effect. Oh, yeah. On me, you know? And all of the experiences that led up to that relationship and beyond, you know, those were such formational years for you. Yeah. Um, there's no way that that couldn't have a lasting effect on your life. Yeah. So after or, you know, so you're you're in this relationship, you know, it sounds like it got pretty bad. What happened after that? So Eric was a year older than I was and he graduated and was his goal was to go into the military and he put it off for quite some time. And the reason for putting it off was that I don't think that he wanted to leave and leave me because I think he knew that 
the minute that I got space Mm -hmm. and clarity, like I would not need him. Right. You know? And luckily, I mean, our relationship had become volatile enough that our families knew about it. Um, My best friend's family knew about it. Like people were very much encouraging me to not be with him. And I finally got an ultimatum from my father who was kind of like, if you're going to be with him, like you can't live under my roof and so I like broke up with him but then I, I was I, and just to like fill in that people can't see when you said broke up you used air quotes <laughs> I did use air quotes so yes. maybe maybe like yeah. pseudo broke up yeah. with him yeah we pseudo broke up and I was seeing him behind everyone's back mm. and my dad found out I like snuck away on a weekend with him and parked my car in his garage my dad knew went to kind of you know, investigate the scene when I came home and asked me about the weekend. I would lied. My dad's like, that's it. Like, as much as it's going to, like, break my heart, like, you, like, I can't support the relationship. Mm-hmm. I can't support you. You can't live here. So interestingly enough, I went to go live with my mom mm-hmm. and kind of rekindled that relationship and worked on things that I was still seeing Eric on and off. And I finally, like through the on and off and all the craziness that was going on in my life, I started to like feel some freedom mm. and started to really realize like how volatile and unhealthy our relationship was. And I tried to break up with him and he lost his shit. Mm. And through that, I ended up calling on the help of my family and decided to leave Mm. i literally left the state of connecticut to get away from him and and your family was supportive very supportive yeah i mean i kind of want to go back to you and touch on how your your dad was like giving you these ultimatums which i think is a really common experience for survivors whether those ultimatums are coming from family or friends um but the the you know it's really hard for someone to see somebody that they love be being hurt and I think the instinct is you know well they'll choose me then if I give them the ultimatum then that's just the tough love they need to kind of get out of the situation and a lot of times it just ends up further isolating the person in that abusive relationship absolutely I feel like due to the abandonment issues that I was dealing with at that point in my life and like my dad hadn't been around a ton because he had to work so hard which was like what I was kind of getting to Mm -hmm. about like my parents working and so as a child like I always just felt tossed aside by my parents Mm -hmm. and so when he gave me the ultimatum and he kicked me out all it did was drive me closer to my abuser right and I mean I clearly see that now right. you know and but as a teenager you're just trying to get your needs met yeah you know yeah. in the best way that you know how and you didn't have those healthy coping mechanisms you were never taught those healthy coping mechanisms so of course you're going to go towards that person who feels comforting and feels like they're a source of stability and getting those needs met yeah absolutely and eric played on it mm. like oh god thinking about it now You know, it just like it was fuel to his fire of like nobody loves you the way that I love you. Like Mm -hmm. no one's ever going to take care of you. Like your parents couldn't take care of you. Like I can take care of you. Right. And for me, sometimes when I look back on it, like the only way I could describe it, it was like my life leading up to that moment was a perfect storm Mm -hmm. to put me right where I was. In a vulnerable position for that person to then come in. And just take over where your life up until that point had left off. Yeah. Yeah. And I think as an adult, especially, you know, in the past, I don't know, like, I feel like I've been deeply healing in like the past 10 years. I mean, I I had left way before that, but the acknowledgement and opening up of like my abuse, like I had kind of been on the train of being against domestic violence and advocating before I was even really able to talk about my own story. Mm. And I know you were a little mm-hmm. bit of a part of that with End the Silence. And, you know, when I said earlier that domestic violence has been a part of my life for a while, like even when I left Eric, it didn't end there. Mm. Because 
that's uh, how I moved to Montana was coming to help rescue my sister out of her right. uh, abusive marriage. And I think like I have gone through what I've gone through and witnessed what I had to witness to be a powerful voice in the community against domestic violence and advocating for healthy relationships. Yeah. Especially because it's an issue that happens so much more often than people realize. Everybody thinks that it happens to somebody else, not in my town, you know, not my friends, not my family, not in my workplace, right? Uh, because it's something that happens behind closed doors and it's so easy to miss. Um, and I think that by having survivors speak out and say, hey, I'm just like you and it happened to me and it happens to people just like you and me all the time and we have to wake up and we have to raise our level of awareness about this issue or it's never going to go away and the cycle will never be broken. Yeah, and that's sad. Mm, it is sad. It is really, really sad. So you, yeah, we'll kind of pick up where you left off. You moved yeah. back with your mom and i moved back with my mom things blew up with mm -hmm. eric and i um i wanted to leave it was the most violent he had gotten with me and i knew that if i didn't take the opportunity that i had at hand to leave to go to california mm -hmm. um, i had a friend who lived there and a place to go stay i almost like thought I remember like driving to California and being so grateful that I left and being like, I don't know how, where that strength came from mm. because I knew that if I didn't just leave and in that pushing him to go and finally go into the military, I don't know if I would have ever have done it, you know, mm -hmm. been able to get away. Yeah. been able to get away. Like I think I would have, stayed like I don't think I could have just been like oh we're broken up and like have been in the same town right with him you know and I think which I think is so common for so many survivors that just because you break up with someone it doesn't mean that it's over you can't just be rid of that person especially if, especially if you're living in the same place um it's really really hard to get that fresh start yeah and it's crazy I don't know when recently I was thinking about him or talking about him, I think I was like catching up with a friend. You know, he ha he has a baby now. I believe that he's married. And I was like, we were talking about that and we were quiet in the car. And I just like said out loud, like in a strange, sick, fucked up way, if I can't cuss, you can edit that oh, out. You, you can <laughs> fucking swear all you fucking want. <laughs> I Go still love it. him, mm. you know, and I think that comes from me being a very empathetic, mm. healing human. He had a really fucked up childhood, too, and right. his dad was an abuser. And then there we go back to the statistics. The cycle. You grow up in an abusive household. If you do not seek out the help that you desperately need you will end up on one side of the fence. Right. The likelihood that you'll be the fence post is so slim, you know? Right. So there we were, like, drawn together. Like, I'm on one side of the fence. He's on the other. We were, like, magnets mm -hmm. to each other. And I do believe that he loved me. Like, I, and I think that was such a big reason why I stayed. And he did love me, and I did love him. It didn't mean that it was healthy for mm -hmm. us and i'm sad for him i'm sad that he still struggles with his demons right he couldn't come out on the other side the way yeah. that you have you know yeah um and i there's a part of me that like wants to be his savior and like be mm -hmm. like the other side is so refreshing mm -hmm. and rewarding but, like, that ship has sailed, right. you know? And it's not your responsibility. <laughs> no, yeah. it's not. And You have your boundaries now to maintain for your own sense of safety and health. Yeah. But it's really beautiful that you still have empathy for him. And that's actually a common theme that's been popping up on the podcast interviews. Interesting, yeah. yeah. That um, survivors can still have that care and that um, compassion for the experiences of that other person 
and be able to recognize that what they've done is not okay. It can be both and, and that's part of what makes it so complicated. Yeah, for sure. So I left them and started my really long journey of healing. And I feel like for me, God, like even like in kind of listening to myself talk, it's like so hard to talk about. Mm -hmm. I find myself like bouncing all over the place. And when you try to go back to those memories, everything like rushes together and like my brain gets fuzzy. But what I really want to talk about yes. is after. Yeah. So here you are. Yeah. So like yeah. here I here I am. I was 19. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be 38 this year. I'm going to be 38 in a couple weeks. I'm graduating college for the first time in a couple weeks. And that 20 what let's let's do some math 18 oh don't look at me 38 so that's almost 20 years and I still cry I still have doubts that are lasting from that time frame mm -hmm. you know that I still sometimes have a hard time shaking even though I feel incredibly educated mm -hmm. about the process, the cycles, um, healthy relationships, healthy boundaries. It's like, I don't think that healing from domestic violence, you know what I would liken it to? It's like being in remission. Mm. I feel like sometimes I'm really good and sometimes it still shakes me mm -hmm. to the core and I find myself leaning into fearful behaviors or like acting out in my current relationship or feeling distant in the relationship for whatever reason. I've been married for seven years. I've been with Paul, my husband, for 11 years. Such a healthy, well-rounded relationship that I have with him. And still, I still cry and struggle with so much that is tied to being a survivor, you know, but for me, it's deep. It runs from my very first memory, you know, to my mom being a victim and survivor, to my sister being a victim and survivor, to me being a victim and survivor, to having moved to Montana to be a part of my sister's life and help her, which in turn made me such a big part of my niece and nephew's life. And now watching my nephew struggle through his, where he's landed on the side of the fence and it's not pretty, you know? And I don't want to tell his story and I don't want to, share too much of that because I feel like it's not my place to share but little guy is struggling and and it goes to show how far reaching the consequences of one person's trauma can be that yes. it can be intergenerational there is a ripple effect there and without intervention that ripple will just keep going and going and going and going. yes and it's hard. I mean, it definitely has taken me in the past couple years a lot of self-awareness to know that the only person that I can work on and heal and have control over their actions or the decisions that they make and the relationships they choose to have is my own. Mm, yeah. And love the people around me unconditionally with an open mind you know um, and what is that like what I'm hearing is like this empowerment piece where it's like the only person I can control is myself the only person I can heal is myself the only you know way that I can heal is through process not by like trying to arrive as yeah. some like higher being so I'm curious to know what does healing look like for you what does healing look like for me I don't even know I feel like it looks like taking charge of your life it looks like taking responsibility for your actions and your reactions mm -hmm. to those around you. It looks like 
a lot of self-awareness, mm-hmm. um, a lot of tears. Mm-hmm. Like feeling and yeah, honoring your feeling emotions. feeling and honoring your emotions. God, it looks like grace. I feel like the older I get, I give myself a lot more grace than I did when I was 20, 25. Um, I think I learned the definition of grace like at 30. It was like I turned 30 and the world was like, here's this box of really amazing things that will teach you to love yourself. <sighs> um And God, I hope like the women out there get that box a lot sooner. Mm. Um, Again, like such a big reason why I'm here. Like I just I want to help women know like whether you were a part of a violent relationship or you witnessed a violent relationship or you tried to help somebody out of a violent relationship, like it will affect you Mm -hmm. for a really long time. And learning that grace piece early on will help you get a lot further quicker than I think I did, you know? Yeah. So I want to, like, un- unpack the toolbox. Yeah. Of great use. <laughs> like, what's in this toolbox? Oh, I love a good metaphor. Um, and I want to talk about, like, what what are those little things that you, you do for yourself every day, every week, every month, every year that helps you have that self-compassion? I surround myself with amazing women, I stay connected to my support. Mm. I have become very willing to talk Mm. about my story and share other people's story and more importantly, listen to other women and their stories. I think more than even telling my story, it's been slowing down enough and truly opening up myself enough to really listen to other women Mm -hmm. because in that you know the like hashtag me too is like so catchy and become this phrase but before that was even like a thing this thing that like hit our world I cannot count how many times you would sit on a couch with a bunch of women and share your stories and be like oh my god me too oh my god me as well like it is it is me too movement because that is like such a it's the reality of it's things. the reality right. of things you know and when you start to connect and listen and share your story the grace comes mm. because you're like wow like i'm not just a s- dumb bitch i wasn't right. just this dumb young bitch that ended up in this terrible situation because I didn't listen to my parents. And, you know, it's like you stop being hard on yourself and you start loving yourself and you realize the reason why you were there is because you didn't do that in the first place. Mm. And I feel like the grace comes, you start to love yourself. Like in that box is like this little I love you pill. Mm. And I just try to take that pill like once every Mm. so often. Like I don't want to get too high on myself. (laughs) Right. Um, I don't want to get too high. I want to take one pill. Just one I love you pill. (laughs) (laughs) Every other day. No. But you do like. That's so interesting. I've actually been learning a lot more about self-compassion recently, which is like the other side of self-care. And I hadn't heard a whole lot about it in the past, but I'm hearing so much about like of self-compassion in what you're saying and the way that I have read um, to understand self-compassion is this idea that like you extend the same grace um, and empathy towards yourself that you would to a friend. Yes. And you are actually doing that when you're listening to a friend and they call themselves, oh God, I'm such a dumb bitch. And you would say to your friend, no, you're not. You're amazing, right? And so then if you can say that to a friend, you can also extend that same compassion to yourself. So then when you have those those kind of self-deprecating thoughts to consciously and intentionally stop yourself and say, would I, what would I say to a friend right now? Because I'm trying, you know, to be my own friend in these situations. And I think that that's really beautiful. And it kind of reminded me of what I've just been learning about recently. Yeah, I love, I, I love that analogy yeah. of like, what would you say to a friend? I, I've practiced that a lot more in my old age. <laughs> and your, old, your beautiful, ripe 38 yeah. years on this planet. Um, well, I think that's all just so powerful. And 
I want to kind of just ask you if you could give a message to any survivor out there who, who might be listening to this. What would you want to tell them? You're not alone, sister. Yeah. You know, like so many of us have been there and so many of us are there. And together, our voices are powerful and together we can heal and like together like we're not alone i think the feeling of being alone makes people do crazy things yeah and it's okay like i just want every person out there that has been through anything remotely close to what i've been through like i just want to like hold them and hug them and be like it's okay mm. and there is an an, another side mm. and sometimes that happens right away for victims like you know that's the other thing too like i have caught myself saying at the same time victim survivor like whatever you choose to identify with that may change mm -hmm. and whatever it is like it's yours like don't let anyone tell you that you're not allowed to be a victim. Don't let anyone tell you that you have to be a survivor. Like, be whatever you want to be in that moment. A. Right. B. That switch, if it happens, um, it doesn't have to happen. A. Well, I guess now that's B. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, that's a really, really you know? important point. Yeah. Because, you know, I think the movement is in a weird place with language, you know, because labels are so personal. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do know from working with victims and survivors yeah. and thrivers and all of that, that everybody has like a word that resonates with them. And sometimes that word victim, although it can feel <sighs> limiting, it's helped people that I've worked with be able to say to themselves, you know what? I didn't do this to myself. Somebody did this to me. Yes. I am a victim in this situation. It wasn't my fault. And maybe that label sticks for a while and maybe it doesn't or maybe it never feels good. But I think um, it's OK for people to use that word, you know, if they yeah. if they need to. Yeah. Giving permission to yes. use that word for sure. And like there's no time limit, like, you know, touching on that. There's no time limit to the next step, whatever that maybe and i feel like for myself i kind of did like a cha-cha with yeah. my <laughs> healing like i would like two steps forward a step back mm. you know a year side step. yeah sidestep a couple like you know drop it low <laughs> <laughs> you know like there's no rule book mm. for healing it's very much a grief process and Whatever that looks like to you, I give you permission mm. to be there. Um, you know, definitely don't like pinch a 10 and stay right. if it's not healthy. Try to work through it and get to the next space. But that is so individual for everybody. Right. And I think a lot of times we want to pick up a self-help book or listen to the right podcast or be told what is next. And I think it's such a personal experience that nobody can tell you what your healing is going to look like. For me, it was all over the place. Um, I went in a lot of different directions. But in the past 10 years, it's been a lot of self awareness, mm. the grace, and doing things that feel good. Mm. And if it feels good, do it. Mm. If it doesn't, don't. And I feel like that resonates so much with what I tell my 18-year-old niece about her relationships now, mm. relationships with men, relationships with women. Um, if it feels good, go with it in that gut that yeah. like intuition place if it doesn't why doesn't it feel good mm -hmm. and should that continue you know mm -hmm. i feel like when we listen slow down and listen to ourselves we usually have 
the answers because my gut told me that my relationship with Eric was wrong the minute that it started to become wrong. And one of the principles that we have at Haven that I've learned about working with people who are trying to heal from these relationships is that everybody has their own wisdom and the ability to find their own wisdom if and they have the ability to move towards growth and healing if they are given safety and if they are given support and the tools that they need everybody can do that yes um and so i i I think that just kind of resonated with me as i was hearing you talk more about like you can heal it's non-linear and it can be frustrating and um, you don't want to wallow in those dark places for too long or get stuck there. But if you give yourself grace and you lean on people and you use the tools that you have, your body wants to be healed. Your mind wants to be healed. Your heart wants to be healed. It will gravitate towards what is healing. Um, just like when you have a cold, your yeah. body wants to get better. And so I think, you know, people trusting that process a little bit, which can be very overwhelming, obviously. Um, but I, I think that that message of hope is super important. For sure. Yeah. That's why it's why I'm here. I know. Yeah. Like I, I just couldn't be happier to be where I am in my life. And I could have never imagined my life being this joyful. And with that being said, there's some hard fucking days still that don't have anything to do with my past, you know, or just like. You're going to be like, life is hard for all for all of us, you know? Being human is really hard. Being human is hard. But if you want joy in your life, you are, everybody is capable of making it. But it's hard work sometimes. Yeah. And you're one of the most joyful people that I know. Really? Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> As joy radiates out of her face. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. And I feel like that's like a great place to stop well, on a super high note. There we are. We're going we're gonna to accentuate it with a really happy punctuation. I love it. Yeah. Be joyful, people. Yeah. Life's too short. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. Be sure to subscribe and don't forget to check out our online community at weareher.net. If you or someone you know has experienced abuse or assault, you can always call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233.